Hello and welcome to the Greenwood Military Aviation Museum, which is located just outside the main gate entrance to 14 Wing Greenwood. The mission of the museum is to acquire and display artifacts that represent maritime military aviation as flown from Greenwood and the maritime provinces, both at home and abroad, since the wing was formed in 1942. We have over 10,000 artifacts now that we have on display, uh, including some six aircraft currently located outside in our air park and a good three airplanes that are on display inside, with more in the process of being restored for display in the future. The museum is made up of several parts, a main indoor display area, an extension where I'm standing right now, a memorial garden or commemorative garden, and an air park. Admission to the museum is free, so please feel free to come and join us. Check our website for our winter and summer hours. Come down, see the museum, spend some time, and learn a bit about Nova Scotia's history and heritage. Over the past 12 years, the Greenwood Military Aviation Museum has been presenting a very successful flight education or flight ed program specifically aimed at grade six students in cooperation with the classroom teachers and escorts from some 14 schools scattered throughout the Annapolis Valley and elsewhere. This program was conceived in 2002 at the initiative of a number of teachers, specifically Mrs. Connie Weinberg from the Pine Ridge Middle School in association with the museum's director, Major Retired Lloyd Graham. Since starting some 12 years ago, the program has provided this course to 6,400 students and their escorts. However, we believe that the excellent work and educational opportunities offered by the Flight Ed program should be shared with others, hence this uh, production of this media presentation so that it can be expanded to all schools within the province of Nova Scotia. The Flight Ed program involves several sections, including uh, dynamics of flight, World War II and what the wing's squadrons were involved with overseas, plus the role of the wing with the British Commonwealth Air Training Program. We then move on to the Cold War period and primarily the role of the Argus and Neptune aircraft. And then on to the Aurora era as we are now with operations against Libya, Afghanistan, ISIS. We also cover search and rescue, the role of the helicopters, the C-130 Hercules, and the search and rescue technicians. There's something for everyone. The stories, information, displays, and educational material could only be made possible through the uh, efforts of our living historians and flight uh, instructors. Generally, two instructors are provided for each area. These instructors are mostly experienced military aircrew and support personnel, either retired or currently serving, along with a few trained civilian instructors. This mix covers a broad spectrum of expertise that not only benefits the students, but also has a positive effect on the team concept of instruction. We hope at the end of this presentation, you are better informed and have a better feel for the dynamics of flight. Good morning, everyone. My name is Mr. Decker, and I'm gonna give you a little bit of history of Greenwood and history of the Second World War. I am a retired navigator, flown about 7,800 hours in various airplanes. First off, think of the Second World War. And I asked you the question, when did it start? It started in 1939, ended in 1945. And when it started, think of England. Think of the geographical area. It's very small, isn't it? I mean, some of our provinces contain more area than what England has. Now, when the war started, they had many uh, bases, that is, airdromes, for fighters and bombers. So, there wasn't much room to train people. And they estimated that they had to train about 100,000 aircrew. So, what do we do? They formed 
the British Air Commonwealth Training Program. And of course, we're part of the Commonwealth. And then they decided, well, where will we go to build airports? Canada, all kinds of open areas, which we still have. So they built 74 training bases, 74 in a very fast time. I mean, within a year, they were operational. Uh, they built three in Nova Scotia. These are training bases. Greenwood, Stanley, and DeBert. Now, initially, Greenwood was a training base for Coastal Patrol. Coastal Patrol meant everything out over the water thousands of miles out, and they still call it Coastal Patrol. Now, what do you think Greenwood? What would be an advantage? You could train out over the Bay of Fundy, or just 10 or 15 minutes and you're out over the Atlantic. The weather is reasonable, for the Maritimes, that is. It's good weather. The area they picked is all flat, so they didn't have to blast uh, rocks out of mountains and so on to build the airport. There was just a, a few farms. They bought the farms, moved the people off, and built the, the airport. At that stage, they only had the runways were very short compared to what they are today. So, it was a training base for Coastal Patrol. The first group arrived in 1942 from England, and they already had one their wings. That is, they were pilot, navigator, bombardier, or uh, air gunner, flight engineer, etc. And they come here for advanced training. Now they used two airplanes primarily for uh, the training. One was the Anson, this yellow air, this picture of the yellow airplane. That trained just about everybody. As I said, everybody had their basic training already when they come here. This was an advanced training, so basically it was for Coastal Patrol. The Anson, guess what it was made out of? Wood. Except, you know, I mean, you can't have engines out of wood or you can't have undercarriage out of wood and so on, but basically everything that could be made out of wood was made out of wood. But why, you say? Because metals were in very short supply. So they wanted those for the big fighter aircraft and the bombers. They also used the Hudson bomber, and that's a picture of a Hudson bomber there. They used that for coastal patrol. As a matter of fact, they used to have a patrol going across from Digby to St. John just to patrol around the ferry when it went over during the Second World War, and that was from here. Now, in 1943, things changed so they, uh, it became a training base for the Mosquito fighter bomber, the best fighter bomber of the Second World War. And guess what? It was made out of wood as well. This was a very high performance airplane, and it was used just about for everything over, over uh, Europe. Now, if you put inexperienced air crew in a high performance airplane, you have a few accidents. Some of these young men, guess what? They never got to the war. They're buried in Kingston in the cemetery and Middleton in the cemetery. So they never got to the war. This corner represents 404 Squadron. 404 Squadron during the Second World War was a coastal patrol squadron, operating primarily out of England and uh, uh, out of France as well. They are now the training squadron for the Aurora airplane. So that's 404. This just illustrates a little bit of uh, what happened during the Cold War. It just shows an Argus that flew over here many years before the Aurora. And that's a Soviet Union cruiser. And he's firing flares at the Aurora maybe because he's a little too close. No shots were ever fired. Now, everything went along from the late 40s, about 48, 49, 
1962, the fall of 62, Cuban Missile Crisis. Soviet Union put missiles in, in Cuba. These could destroy all the cities up the eastern seaboard of the United States. These powerful cities, they could just wipe them off the map. So, the Americans wanted the Soviet Union to take the missiles out of Cuba. And, of course, what would the Soviet Union say? No. 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 So, the Americans blockaded Cuba. That is, they put a ring of ships around and said, nobody goes in, nobody goes out. But at the same time, the Soviets had actually ships with missiles on them going towards Cuba to restock, so to speak. Everybody was at a wartime footing. Everybody was at sea. All ships were at sea. People were doing long-range patrols with long-range airplanes. They're doing patrols off carriers. Uh, everybody was in a war footing. That is, the torpedoes we carried actually had warheads. That is, all you had to do was push the button and they would be active and they would blow something up if they hit it. We don't know how many submarines were out there, but there were lots and we tracked quite a few submarines. The Soviets took the missiles out of Cuba. We just went back to the Cold War. 405 Squadron is the operational Aurora Squadron here at Greenwood, flying the Aurora. During the Second World War, they were a bomber squadron. They were Canada's first bomber squadron and the only Canadian squadron to be Pathfinders. Pathfinders would go out over Germany, mark the target, and wait till about maybe six, seven, eight hundred airplanes drop their bombs, and then they would go back to England. They might even have to remark the target. As a result, they lost 801 aircrew, died. Just as one squadron, 801, died. That's because they were in the, in the target area so long. So that's 405, the operational squadron at Greenwood now. 413 squadron is the prime search and rescue squadron here on the East Coast. A very large area they cover. And during the Second World War, they were a coastal patrol squadron. One thing you notice, look at all the squadrons. They start with the number four. That's because during the Second World War, Canada was allocated the 400 series squadrons. They, these guys were uh, a coastal patrol squadron. They were operating over the Indian Ocean. So instead of being in England and Europe, they were down over the Indian Ocean. The British had a very large base down there in Ceylon, and uh, they would send airplanes out every day looking for the Japanese fleet. So Squadron Leader Birchall, Canadian, found the Japanese fleet, but they shot him down. He was in a flying boat. That model is the Kanso flying boat. And uh, he ended up to be a prisoner of war for the rest of the war. But he got the message out of where the Japanese were located. And, of course, surprise is the big thing of war. Japanese never did attack Ceylon, so he was called the savior of Ceylon. These are all the Canadians, pictures of all the Canadians that were killed in Afghanistan. So... You could say that these people died for us. This is the highest award anybody in the British Commonwealth military can receive. We had four airmen during the Second World War receive the Victoria Cross. That's only, only four. Unfortunately, they didn't receive it. Their families did because they all died. Very interesting stories here for various uh, heroics.
Hi, my name is Bill Fraser, and along with Jack Brittany, we're here to uh, provide uh, information on the Argus environment, the Argus aircraft environment, and the Cold War, and how we used the airplane during Cold War years to hunt submarines. Uh, we use this uh, museum artifact here, which was actually an, uh, an Argus aircraft at one time, and then was uh, turned into a trainer that we used in Greenwood for many, many years. And of course, now it, that we don't use the Argus operationally anymore, it's now part of our museum exhibit here, and we can use it to uh, show people uh, the actual air environment, the actual Argus environment, and how uh, all the equipments worked, and how we uh, managed to hunt submarines during the Cold War years. Hi, I'm Jack Brittany. I was a navigator on the Argus, and I, so I've flown extensively during the Cold War. And so what we want to talk to, what I'm going to talk to you about is the Argus and a little bit about the Cold War. Okay, now the Cold War was a period of time between <coughs> nine, roughly after the Second World War, which was 1945 when it ended, to about roughly 1993. Now the Cold War in that period, there was no, they call it the Cold War because there was no atomic weapons used. There was all sorts of little, wet, little other little wars that went on like the Korean War and a few other wars all over the place. But the Argus was built during the Cold War. In fact, the first Argus was, flew in 1958 and <coughs> it was designed to hunt submarines during the Cold War. Okay. Now, so it was a large air aircraft, crew of 15. You couldn't very well sit, and when I say large aircraft, it had long, long range. For example, you went out a thousand miles, stayed 10 hours on patrol, and then came home. Now that's a roughly a 20 hour trip. So uh, their Argus has a record of 32 hours airborne without refueling. So it was a long range airplane. But the, the Cold War, the reason this, for this bird built during the Cold War, because of the circumstances. There's a big reason, and I'm going to show you why. Come on down this way. As you can see this map. Now here's Greenwood right here in Nova Scotia, right there. Now, like I said, we could go out a thousand miles, which would be roughly in the middle of the Atlantic stay 10 hours on patrol. Sometimes we go to Iceland or maybe to England or to Gibraltar. Quite often to the little places called the Azores and of course back to Greenwood, but all up and down the United States. Now the reason why is because up here the Soviet submarine bases had nuclear powered submarines with nuclear tipped missiles. Okay? Now, they would come down, and all they would do was just sort of sit and wait, and our job was to go out and find them, track them, and try not to let them know that we were there. So our job was to find these guys, keep track of them, and if the event that the war did break out, find them and sink them. Okay, this, this is the, what the Argus looked like inside. The pilot and the co-pilot and the flight engineer up front, of course, this first white area it was a navigator and radio officer, officer position. This next bit here was a galley which had a fridge, stove, oven, and all that good stuff, lots of food and coffee. This area here, the second white area, is the, we call it the tactical section. That's where the business of hunting submarines took place, okay? Finally, the very back, we call it the ASW or anti-submarine warfare position. See right there? See those racks in the middle? Those were what we called Sonoboy launchers. Those were devices that we would put in the launchers, fire them out, and they would land in the sea, and they would transmit the noise of the sea back up to us. In other words, the only way we could find a submarine is by the noise that it made. Now, if we take these two white areas, and slide them together, that's what we got here is the old Argus trainer, okay? This is the routine navigator section. Now we had to have somebody at this position at all times for one reason, which the Argus did not have, a computer. So this guy here had to be here to find the position of the airplane 
when it's out to sea because the thing is there's no landmarks out at sea or anything like that so he had to be very accurate on what he did the we had long-range radio navigation as we call it it was okay during the daytime in some some areas but there were some areas in the Atlantic that were blank there was no nothing and at night this was terrible so as a navigator I used this quite often so did Christopher Columbus it's called a periscopic sextant and with that I'd put it in see that mount up top there yeah. oh so you put it in put there. it in there yep oh, I've seen and that this on the movies. and this about this much would be out in the slipstream uh -huh. and with that I could take a bearing on the sun the moon the stars and the planets and make and find the position of the airplane oh, the radio operator now remember what this is during the Cold War everything was a very very secret he carried the codes by that any message that he sent had to be coded up any message he received was used, was coded and he'd have to decode it those are signal cartridges for example now if we were working with Navy ships they would not talk to you on the radios because there's usually always a Soviet what we called intelligence gathering vessel somewhere nearby if I fired that flare gun in the wall there and fire that they look up in their code book and it says oh he's in contact with an enemy submarine and needs help but tomorrow if I fired that it might and they looked it up again because of a different day it might say I've lost an engine and I'm going home see the gentleman sitting there that's the tactical navigator in other words as a navigator I do do two hours up front two hours here and then go find for the next two hours go try and find a bunk get a bite to eat so that's how it worked. It was all the positions, pretty much. Now then, he plotted all the information that these guys gathered back here. He would also drop and plot a sauna boys where we wanted to look for submarine. Now over here was the radar operator. For the Argus, it was, it was mainly for keeping track of the weather because the weather out over the Atlantic was terrible. Back here was the, what we called the acoustic operators. This is a sauna boy. This remember that picture I showed you out front there, the yellow objects. But this is it's a sauna boy. And what happens is when it's fired out of this out of the chute in the back of the airplane, there's fins on the top that spin like a little helicopter. Now when it hits the water, this plate will pop off. The fins will pop off. Water will get into an air uh, into a seawater battery. And what we have here, this hydrophone as it's called, or very sensitive microphone, will drop down to 100 feet, maybe 300 feet, depending on the selection. And it would transmit anything that it heard up to these guys up here. Now they were very good at what they did. Now this is called, what we call a, a sonogram. This is what these, this particular machine would print. Now you can see that there's all kinds of lines and stuff on here. This, if I can find it, yep. Right there is a very, very thin line. That, believe it or not, is a generator on a nuclear submarine, Russian nuclear submarine. So the generator that produces this electrical power makes a noise, which they can interpret. He'll say, hey, I've got a submarine on boy 10, which he dropped. He knows where it is. And so we've located that submarine and we narrowed the Atlantic down to a few square miles. Yeah. I'm Ernie Supple. I was uh, 16 years as a fitter in the RCAF and uh, the last four years a flight engineer and I flew on the Argus aircraft and this is the position on the aircraft where the flight engineer works. We're flying and the engineer is uh, responsible for all the controls for the engines, the uh, throttles, prop selection and fuel selection. Also, we monitor all the gauges on the aircraft and there's uh, one set of gauges for every engine. The engineer is responsible for all, all settings on power given by the pilot in the left-hand seat. On takeoff, the pilot will call for a wet or dry power. A wet power is a mixture so that we can go to a, a 180 torque with the RPM. The engineer, when he gets the plan, opens up the throttles, makes sure the the pitch is in fine, or for fine pitch, takeoff pitch, and all the fuel selectors are in the right positions. 
and we want them to the uh, to the torque and the RPM going down the runway, and when the air, we start to take off, the pilot will call for 2600 or meter power as it was called, and we will bring the throttles back to uh, 50 torque and the propellers back to 2600 RPM. The lever that the engineer controls is controls all four uh, propellers uh, through a master con electrical control, but it also can, can be controlled manually. Uh, if we have a problem with electricity part of the control system. The only time the pilot handles and the throttles on this aircraft is when we land and he puts the throttles into a reverse position so that it helps slow down the, the engine. And then we taxi back into the hangar and shut down the aircraft. My name is Amanda Huddleston and I'm going to be discussing the contributions of women starting with the Second World War. During the Second World War, hundreds of thousands of women entered into industry. They were responsible for building such things as Lancaster aircraft and guns and tanks and, and military uniforms. So the women stepped up and they filled that void. For the women in industry, this would have been a typical uniform for them. They had to keep their hair back and out of their face. They had overalls on um, to protect themselves from the machinery. Because of uh, women entering industry and wearing uniforms such as this, this is when you could see women slowly transitioning out of skirts and dresses into pants like we see today. An excellent example of women in industry during the Second World War is the production of aircraft. The Anson is another example of that, as you can see in these pictures, which was produ produced in Amherst, Nova Scotia. They were unable to join combat trades. They were only allowed to fill positions such as truckers, operators, clerks, any position that would not put them in harm's way. Now for the Canadian Air Force Women's Division, their slogan was so that men can fly. So their sole purpose was to free up men so that they could go and fill the combat positions. Four Canadian women that were not satisfied with that and they went over to England and joined the ATF. So they were part of the, the contribution of moving aircraft from factories to bases or from moving uh, planes between the two air bases or in situating planes in preparation for such things as D-Day. Because of the women that we've discussed to this point, we are now able to, to join all trades within the military. That includes combat roles, um, and being on submarines, naval ships. It also means that women are flying planes now. In this case, we have Mary Cameron Kelly, who was our first female Aurora pilot. So during the, the Second World War, women were able to prove themselves as equals. Nowadays, we are recognized as equals in the military, especially. Okay, welcome to this stop <laughs> in the uh, morning at the museum. My partner, Major Alan Bailey, uh, uh, is a uh, he's an engineering officer on the other side of the field. Currently, teaches people how to learn how to fix the airplanes, learn how to break the airplanes. Us people that fly them. <laughs> I am a retired Air Force. Used to fly in the Argus, the Sea King, and the Aurora. What we're going to do here is show you a little bit about the evolution of airplanes and how they're actually controlled. Now, I get to ask the first question, however. Who is responsible for the first powered flight in North America? The Wright brothers, Wilbur and Orbel Wright. We do have extra money, though, if you uh, can tell me who was responsible for the first powered flight in Canada or the British Empire. John D. McCurdy. 
in Bedeck, Nova Scotia in 1909. So, the first powered flight would look something like this. The Wright brothers were the first to be successful to have a heavier-than-air machine fly under its own power. This was due, in fact, to two 25-horsepower engines specially designed that were lightweight and able to have a good power-to-weight ratio to lift the aircraft. Front-mounted elevators allow the craft to move up and down. The rudder allowed it to move left and right. And while a wing warping mechanism stabilized the airplane and allowed the bank. And that's what the first power flight looked like. Here's the airplane that they used to do it in. Really doesn't look much like an airplane that you've seen these days, is it? No. Amongst other things, the elevator, or the, in this case, the rudders in the back, same as uh, current airplanes. But look at the elevators in the front. Look at all the blockiness on here. We've got struts, wires, open stuff all over the place. What's all this open stuff going to cause? Drag. Drag. It's going to drag you back. You can't go anywhere. You've got to overcome the drag. Look at what we've got down here. It turns these two big propellers, that little tiny motor there. 12 horsepower. Same as your average lawn tractor or snowblower. See the pilot laying down there? Why would he be laying down there? Drag. That's what it would cause. But there was another reason, too. You can't see it very well, but there is a harness right there. You can see just a bit of it there. They didn't know about ailerons then. You just saw the ailerons and the Spitfire. What they did is they had a harness around his waist, and when he wanted to turn the airplane to bank it, he actually had to throw his body from one side or the other, and he warped the wings. Wing warping, ailerons. That's how we did it. You gotta improve on a system like that. So here we are. Unfortunately, we're into the First World War, but look at the improvement to the airplane. Still has two wings, got lots of, uh, still has some struts, some wires, but not nearly as much as it had before, sort of thing. Even the fuselage has been enclosed now because all the air flowing by is not gonna drag on all the framework. Like they've even enclosed the wheels. They are spokes like uh, bicycle wheels and whatnot. But they're enclosed, sort of thing, cut down in the drag. Now this airplane could go a lot further, a lot far higher, and a lot faster. It's a lot heavier. They needed a lot more power. So now they've got 120 horsepower in it. You want to keep on improving things. Unfortunately, now we're into the Second World War. This is an Avro Lancaster. For those of you that can see through snow banks or across them really, really well, we have one on the other side of the parking lot. The big silver airplane is an Avro Lancaster. Notice it's only got one wing on it now. The landing gear sucks up into the nacelles, gets rid of some of the drag. The pilot is enclosed, unlike the Sopwith where he was out in the open. The gunners are inside perspex and stuff like that that's all rounded off so that the air will flow over them reasonably well. This wire here is just a communications thing. You still have the tail wheel here, but you can't get rid of everything all at once. This airplane was designed to carry eight, or eight to ten tons of bombs. Could be up there for over eight hours. And it's all metal. So it needed a lot more power. They now have four 1,200 horsepower Merlin engines on it could last eight hours. Keep on improving things. Now we're into the early 60s and 70s and 80s, which we flew here from Greenwood. The Argus. When you came into the uh, parking lot here, there was one right at the corner. It's so big that it could peek over the snowbanks. Sort of thing. Quite a bit smoother than most of the other airplanes, uh, with the exception of these two protrusions here, which are called radomes. And the purpose of these radomes is the front of that airplane, there's a radar antenna that's about half the size of this table. Now, if you took that table and you're holding it up in the air like that, can you imagine how much drag that's going to be? 300 kilometers an hour. And to make it more interesting, 
that antenna goes around like that. Just get ripped right off the airplane. So they built those radomes around it to uh, cut down on the drag. And you'd think an airplane that big, nothing could slow down, slow it down a lot. But they went from an antenna that big to an antenna that big. And just by changing the size of that antenna, it increased the cruising speed of this airplane by 30 kilometers an hour. It could go 30 kilometers an hour faster. Uh, let's see. It's got four huge engines on it, 3,750 horsepower each. And part of the reason why they had to have this great big engines on there is because it's a big airplane. Yes, it carried torpedoes and such like that, and it actually carried mines and bombs too and whatnot. But the important thing is this airplane could stay out for in excess of 30 hours. A normal flight on this airplane was 12 to 18 hours. And this was before air-to-air -air refueling. So it had to carry over 65,000 pounds of fuel alone. It carried enough fuel so it could stay up there for the 30 hours. We keep on improving things. What are we flying today? The Aurora. We're still flying it. We've been flying it for almost 30 years now. It's a lot smoother still, sort of thing. Still has four engines like uh, the other airplanes. But the difference on these engines is these are jet engines turning propellers. All the others were just gasoline engines sort of thing, same as you got in your car. The reason they did this with this airplane is the job of this airplane is to leave Greenwood and go out to the middle of the ocean someplace and look for uh, submarines, fisheries violations, uh, oil pollution, drug running, nasty stuff like that. Well, a jet engine is more efficient at high altitude and propellers are efficient at low altitude. The job of this thing, he would leave Greenwood, get up to around 20 to 25,000 feet, maybe fly for three or four hours out to the middle of the ocean someplace. Then he would get down close to the water. He'd be a couple of hundred feet above the water. So while he was at high altitude, the jet engines were really good. When he's a couple of hundred feet above the water during the patrol, sort of thing, you want that pilot to have really good control of the airplane. And when he's got propellers on there, he has really good control, very in quick response to anything he wants that thing to do. And you want him to have good control. You'll notice there's a lot of little antennas sticking out the bottom here. Uh, you'd think they cause a lot of drag, but in fact they don't. This is actually about four times the size of those small antennas. There's one thing like this. This one's called a drain mast. If you were flying through the air like that, of course, there'd be a ton of drag. Like that, not very much drag at all, because it just flows around nicely all around it. If you want to go fast, though, you pick on something like this. You don't see them around here very much, but you sure hear them a lot. See all the rake on the, uh, these surfaces here, and the wings all slope back? the shape of the body and whatnot. It's all designed to go fast. Now, when it's all messed up like this, though, with all these fuel tanks and sensors and rockets and bombs and things like that, it's not going to go fast if you consider a thousand kilometers an hour slow. If you really want to go fast, you tidy it up a little. When you clean it all up like this, it goes like stink. 1.8 times the speed of sound. Or put another way, takes off from Greenwood, goes straight up, 50,000 feet in three minutes. Or he leaves Greenwood and he's in Halifax in less than five minutes. The trade-off, of course, is when he's going that fast, he's going to run out of fuel real fast. And the boss gets really upset if you crash his airplane. So how do you control it all? This is the inside of a Tudor airplane. It's an older type of airplane, was used for 20 years to train every pilot in the Canadian Forces. For the last 20 years, it's been used as an air demonstration airplane by the Canadian Forces Snowbirds. Now, we're not going to discuss all of these instruments here. We'll just pick on this six here. It's a basic set of instruments that be in virtually every airplane in the world today, whether it's a little tiny Cessna or a great big A380 Airbus. In one form or another, this set of instruments are in there. The old ones have them analog like this. The Airbus has computer screens. 
This is an airspeed indicator. It tells the pilot how fast he's going through the air sort of thing. It's marked off in hundreds of knots. In this case, one being 100 knots, which is 200 kilometers an hour. This is an attitude indicator. It tells the pilot what the attitude of the airplane is at any given time. Now, on a shiny day like this, you don't need the attitude indicator. That uh, the gray is the sky and the dirt is the dark stuff there. But if you were in uh, snow or rain or at night, things like that where you can't see the ground, that would be really helpful. And Alan's going to demonstrate that in a minute. This is the altimeter. It tells the pilot where he is, how high he is in relation to sea level. Right now it's indicating he's 100 feet above sea level because everything is relative to sea level and Greenwood is 100 feet above sea level. This is a vertical speed indicator, tells the pilot how fast he's going up or down, which is really helpful to know, especially when you get close to the ground. For example, if you brought this thing in at 1,000 feet a minute and hit the ground on the gear, there's a very good chance you would punch the gear up through the, through the wings, and that really ruins your day. This is a glorified compass called a horizontal situation indicator, tells the pilot the direction he's going, but these needles here are slaved to some radios and the pilot dials in these radio stations and he knows where they are so he can form a mental picture of where exactly he is. In this instance there's one on the base and there's another one back at Aylesford. And this is an instrument landing system uh, guide that will help the pilot land the airplane properly and Alan's going to demonstrate that in a minute. Let's take a look at the controls themselves and then Alan's going to take it up flying. The elevator makes the airplane go up or down. The rudder kicks the nose one way or the other. The wing warping or the ailerons in this instance, when one is up, the other is down. This one is down, makes extra lift on that side, but this one here, the lift is being spoiled, so the airplane tilts that away. Now, at slow speed, the pilot can put out the flaps sort of thing, and it gives him just a little bit more lift. The trade-off is it also causes drag, so he has to decide what he needs more, the lift or the safety sort of thing. And if you want to slow this airplane down because there is no propellers, you use the speed brakes. Let's go flying. Okay, now, Alan has done this so many times that he knows when he's going to uh, be at the right distance, so we won't stay inside for very long. But basically, here we are getting moving. You can see how the speed is starting to build up. He will need at least 100 knots to get airborne. We'll see what it looks like from the outside. Now just watch the elevator. When he knows it, when he's far enough, he will pull back and up he goes. He's going to get rid of the drag. He doesn't need the gear anymore. He's going fast enough now that he doesn't need the aid for the flaps. And now we'll take a look at this. See how the elevator Makes her up and down. Rudder kicks the nose around. And the aileron tilts her around. Remember what I said about the attitude indicator? Look, at there's the sky and there's the sky. Now, whatever Alan does, it's going to follow. If he climbs or descends, it'll follow. If he tilts it, whatnot. So he can tell exactly what he's doing there. Here we are, lined up. We're going to la come in for a landing on the same runway we just left. There's the base there. He's at 1,200 feet, descending around 500 feet a minute, doing 150 knots. This instrument landing guide that I was telling you about here, see how this needle is lined up right in the center? That tells him he's lined up nicely on the center of that. There. This needle here is sneaking on down. What's happening there is there's an electronic signal that's making a perfect three degree glide path right to the end of the runway. And that's telling him where he is in relation to that perfect three degrees. There, that tells him, there because it's right in the center, that means he's right bang on that glide path. Now there's a set of lights up there when he's got a visual, if he can see those lights, he could use them. Runway. He's going through 200 feet. You'll notice he has the speed brake out here. This light tells him the speed brake is out. The reason he has the speed brake out is a jet engine is very slow to respond. If he were to get in trouble and he suddenly needed more power, all he's got to do is pull in the speed brake because he had the speed brake out and the engine is going fast enough to overcome that power. 
and through the beauty of simulation, he can do an instant replay. We can just keep repeating this last landing as many times as you wanted to actually look at anything you wanted to look at it. You can, you can see the speed brakes out there, see what it looks like from up top. You can see what is, see how nice his landing was. See? Just a very slight float and he got all three landing, all three gear on the ground all at once. There we go. That's how you fly an airplane. I'm Peter Sayers, uh, Chief Warrant Officer Retired, Dave Chevalier, a Master Warrant Officer Retired. Today we're going to explain a lift, what causes thrust, because thrust creates lift from a reciprocating engine, this is old school, to a turbo propeller engine, and to a Rolls-Royce V12, and to the beginning of the jet uh, aircraft uh, engines which is a Rolls-Royce Neen 10. Do we know Mr. Brunelli? Ever heard it? How about Mr. Newton? Okay. Mr. Bernoulli said that if you increase the speed of air over a curved surface, you're going to have a low pressure area here. Increase the speed, decrease the pressure and therefore you're going to have more pressure under the wing than you do on top and we're going to have lift. So lift overcomes gravity. Okay, how do we do it? First of all we have a little engine here in this aircraft and we have a propeller on it. Now this is very interesting, this propeller, because you'll notice that it's flat on the back and it's curved on the front just like a wing. So therefore it's going to be low pressure on the front and it's going to be thrust on the back and thrust will overcome drag and that's a lift or thrust will overcome drag. Examination in school when you have flight ed will be a low pressure on the top, lift will overcome gravity and thrust overcomes drag. Four things. Okay this is a fixed pitch propeller and that means that it'll go from sea level to about maybe five, seven thousand feet, we'll say. And then it starts to lose its thrust because the air is getting thinner. Okay, let's get into this one. A man named Mr. Turnbull, back in, uh, back in the threes, uh, and he was from uh, New Brunswick. He designed the first variable pitch propeller. And variable pitch, we mean that in this one here we have an electric motor that fits here. You'll see it is underneath the red dome there. It fits in the front here and it will turn these blades at the same time. On takeoff we'll be going at 2900 RPM with the engine speed and then when we go to climb we'll go to 2600. We're variable pitch. We can change the pitch of this propeller blade now. And at 2600 we'll call for the gear up and the flaps up. Why would we want to get rid of the tires and the wheels and everything and bring the flaps up? Drag. Get rid of drag. So we'll do that and then we'll cruise at about that speed. That's very nice. Then on landing we can reverse pitch that. Now we're going to reverse the thrust and it's going to aid in the, the uh, braking of the aircraft. It'll aid the braking. What do we have here? We have a big engine, a Wright Cyclone, and this engine was designed uh, for any large aircraft. But that's the Argus aircraft, and this is the type of engine, and this is the propeller that this engine drove. We have a starter. We get in here. This thing here is called a supercharger. The supercharger is for the engine, and that's so it can breathe properly. At about 12,500 feet, uh, we're getting thin of air. In other words, it's the same as you and I. We're normally aspirated. We breathe, we don't even think about it. The engine is breathing too, and it needs that air. But when it gets around 12,500 feet, the air is getting rather th thin. So we will have to put this in double speed 
to keep the air coming in to the engine so it can breathe as well. That is air-cooled radial engine. Okay, let's go over here. We have a turbo propeller engine. This one is on the Hercules and on the Aurora aircraft. Now then, we have a lot of power in this one too. It's a very small jet engine and it gives us 4,600 shaft horsepower. What we're interested with this engine is we want the power to turn a propeller. With a jet engine, a straight jet engine like that, we're interested in thrust to drive the aircraft. The, the, what we do here now is the propeller is an excellent, a very efficient piece of machinery for flying at low altitude. The jet engine is an excellent engine to run at high altitude, so therefore we have the best of both worlds, very efficient. So that is the turbo propeller engine. And what do we have here? We have a centrifugal flow jet engine. How many have put water in a bucket and swung it around like this? If you're going fast enough, then you have centrifugal flow. So the air comes in here. This big fan here throws it around this, and we call this a manifold. And it'll throw the air around this manifold in a centrifugal flow, and then it comes out through this elbow into the combustion chamber, and it expands and out in the back at 5,000 pounds of static thrust just to move the aircraft forward. That's part of Newton as well. You would have to have more power than the weight of the aircraft or it wouldn't go anywhere. So remember that uh, lift overcomes gravity and thrust overcomes drag. Remember Mr. Newton, for every action there's an opposite and equal reaction and Mr. Bernoulli uh, is if you increase the speed of something over a curved surface, you'll have a de decrease in pressure. I'm Bob McKelman. Uh, I'm a retired Air Force pilot, Canadian military. Uh, I spent many years in the military flying uh, around Greenwood with uh, the multi-engine airplane, plus some time in, uh, in jets before that. Uh, this basically is an ejection seat that uh, we're going to talk about, uh, where uh, it, it's used to get the pilot away from an airplane that is going to crash. Uh, the thrust that's uh, provided by the uh, rocket motor in the back of that seat uh, equivalent to uh, th the thrust that would move anything else, uh, much like, say, the torpedo we're going to uh, go to next. We're going to talk about an ejection seat. Who knows what an ejection seat is? Go ahead. It ejects a portion out of the plane. That's right. If, if an airplane is going to crash, the ejection seat makes sure that the guy who's flying the airplane is not going to be at the scene of the crash. He's going to have to get out of the airplane and be away from it. This is the back seat out of an airplane just like that one right there, a T-33 trainer. Okay. Back seat, there'll be another seat in front of it. <coughs> this airplane typically flies anywhere from the surface up to about 35 to 40,000 feet. When you're in it, you're going to be all dressed up like this guy over here with a helmet, an oxygen mask. Most importantly, you're going to have all these straps around your torso. That holds the parachute that's on his back. So you're cruising along at 35,000 feet and something happens to the airplane, like catches fire, the engine blows up or something like that. You decide to eject. So what you do is you reach down, yellow and black handles, you pull them up like that. When you do that, it jettisons the canopy, so the canopy is gone. Okay? Almost simultaneously, you're going to squeeze the trigger on here. When you do that, it actually fires a rocket motor that's attached to the bottom and the back of the seat, forces that seat up these rails and out of the airplane, just like this guy is doing right here. No. I said that the whole canopy went. Uh, you notice the front part of the canopy is, in fact, still on here. The reason for that is this is a trial of the ejection system. And that's really a crash test dummy. It's not a real person. And that guy's going to have to fly the airplane back and land it. Okay? <coughs> you notice that the guy, the, the crash test dummy, is coming away from the seat. You can see the, the clouds in the background behind his knees and behind his back. What's happened there is that once that seat exits these rails, it activates a micro switch that does a couple of things. The first thing it does, it fires a small explosive charge in here 
that fires that pin out. <coughs> Excuse me. You're you're now free to come away from the seat. Okay. Second thing it does is it takes this strap and it winds it up on a coil in the back of the seat very very quickly, and throws you and that seat pack away from the seat. The reason that seat pack is with you that contains all your survival gear. If at this point you're at 10,000 feet or below, your parachute's going to automatically open right away. If you're above 10,000 feet, there's a barometric capsule contained in the parachute that just measures air pressure, and it won't allow it to automatically open until you're at 10,000 feet. If you're out in the mountains and you have to open the parachute higher than that, you can always pull the D-ring on here and it'll open it. Any idea why that might be? Have you ever seen pictures of people climbing mountains? What are they wearing on their face? What kind of a mask? Uh, it's sort of like a gear mask. Um, An oxygen mask. Yeah, the reason for that is in our atmosphere, the higher up you go in our atmosphere, the thinner it gets. The thinner the atmosphere gets, the less oxygen there is in it. For guys like you and I, who basically live and operate at sea level, we can't go much above about 10,000 feet before we start running into problems with lack of oxygen. So the parachute automatically looks after that for you. So you bail out at 35,000 feet, you free fall down to 10,000 feet, the parachute opens and you glide down slowly to the ground. You've still got this thing strapped to the back of your legs, but the way it's got your knees bent, you can't land like that or you're going to do damage to your knees or your ankles or your legs. Normally there's a little red handle right in here. You pull up on that and it drops that seat pack down on a lanyard about 10 meters below you. It's fastened to your parachute with a little D-ring in here. Okay, this, this is a torpedo, typical of what they would carry in the Aurora, the, one of the airplanes that flies around here. Uh, it can carry up to eight of them in the bomb bay. They're shackled in with these big substantial shackles here. These wires are just to release the shackles. They're electronically connected to the airplane with a cable similar to this. All that's for is so that <coughs> the guys on the airplane can pre-program the torpedo to search uh, a specific pattern once it goes in the water. It's also connected in the back end with a lanyard like this. All that's for is so that it'll open the parachute that's contained in this satchel here. Once it comes out of the airplane, all these things disconnect from the airplane and the torpedo is on its own. It has to be able to do everything without any input from the people in the airplane. So once it goes in the water, first thing that happens is it jettisons the parachute off the back end. Water goes in this port here and it must be salt water. The salt water acts as an electrolyte and a battery. The battery will start uh, producing power like the battery in your car, your parents' car at home. The only difference is they use an acid to, uh, to produce the power. It fires up the motor in this part that runs counter-rotating propellers. And they're counter-rotating so that the torpedo will turn, uh, go in a straight line. If there's only one propeller, it's going to want to turn in a big circle. It can steer itself left and right, up and down. Okay, coming for is the motor, the battery in here. This section in here contains the, uh, all of the mechanism to make it steer the patterns that, uh, that you can either pre-select or what the, the torpedo itself uh, calls for once it detects the, the submarine. This section contains the warhead, the thing that makes it go kaboom. Okay. Up in the front, there's a rubber pad on the nose of this. Behind that rubber pad is a transducer. All that is is an antenna that listens for sound in the water. And once it hears the sound of the submarine, it'll start going towards the submarine. As it gets closer, it goes active, where it sends out a sonar ping in the water, and by measuring the time from when it left here, reflects back off the target, it's called echo sounding. The torpedo knows how far away it is and in what, uh, what direction it'll go and run into it. Now, a torpedo like this may not sink a big modern submarine. All you're hoping it's gonna do is at least enough damage so that the, air, the uh, submarine ha either has to come to the surface or go home for repairs. Either way, it's of no use to the, to the war effort. This next section on uh, aeronautics is uh, the basis of the entire course that's being taught and it has to do with the four factors that have to be considered when you try to put an airplane in the sky. We have thrust, lift, drag, and we have weight. And a man who knows all about those four factors who flew as a pilot all his life is Ted Taylor. Here he is. Good, good. Okay, we'll get going here. This thing that you're looking at, my pride and joy, is a two-thirds scale model of a Spitfire. That is a fighter. It's an air defense fighter in Britain 
during World War II. Actually, the things flew right up to the mid-1950s in the uh, Royal Air Force in England. Basic design, designed to do one thing, shoot down other airplanes. And it did it very, very well. Anybody knows anything about World War II will find out that Spitfire is one of those names that pops to the, uh, the fore every time. But this is a 12-cylinder engine in this little airplane. That, and that was enough power to uh, push this thing as high as 42,000 feet at speeds in excess of 400 miles an hour. And in 1939, when it was built, first built, that was a pretty good, uh, pretty darn good record. Okay, it was uh, built as an air defense fighter, and as such, it had to be well armed, and, and the airplane was well armed. It was a Browning 303 caliber machine gun. Uh, there were two mounted in each wing, and they put out an awful lot of lead, okay? Because they fired them all usually at the same time. As, as, along with the uh, machine guns, they had two 20 millimeter cannons. They were just a much bigger, 20 millimeters is just about a half an inch slug. So that was what was coming at you. So it was a well-armed well -armed, uh, uh, aircraft for, for that sort of thing. Right, that's a fuel cap. The entire wing is a, fuel, uh, a gas tank. Okay, that's a lot of gas. But amazingly, there's only about two hours worth of fuel. Both wings are full. Of course, they're going so fast that the that's fuel like burns. You're right. She's burning her right up. So it was not designed for long, long trips. It just didn't have enough gas to keep it going that long. Okay. How do you measure your speed? Okay. First of all, the units they use is knots. That's nautical air, nautical miles, okay? A little different from the statute miles that we're used to. They're a little bit longer. But the way they measure it is by means of this little device here. It's called a pitot tube. There are two tubes inside this casing, different diameters, and as the airflow goes through these, because of the diameter changes, the, the air flows through at a different speed, okay? That information is fed to the cockpit and displayed in an airspeed indicator, which tells you how fast you're going through the air, not necessarily over the ground because the wind affects that. If you're flying into the wind, you're going to go slower over the ground. If you've got a tailwind, you're going to go faster. Now, anybody tell me what this thing is? No. That's close. It's called an aileron. If you're going this way, you want to go that way, turn, you put the stick to the left, this aileron comes up. The one in the other wing goes yeah. down. You got the, an angle of bank established. Then, with the, using a little bit of rudder, feeding in a bit of that, and a little back pressure, you do your turn. Conversely, you want to turn to the right, stick goes right, right aileron, the aileron goes up, left aileron goes down, and you turn that way. Okay. Now, you got another thing under here. It's a flap. The flap alters the course of the air over the wing and under the wing. And with the flap extended, you get a shorter flow under the wing, and that allows you to fly at a lower speed. Okay? Simply all, all it does is give you controllability at a lower air speed. Okay, this is the tail section of the airplane. Named that because it's at the tail end of the airplane, right? Okay. This is called Rudder, right on, how you steer a boat. You, if you want to do a, a, a coordinated turn, if you're going to turn left, you put the stick to the left, then you put a little bit of rudder to the left, and you get a coordinated turn. Okay? What do you use to get from the ground floor to the 10th floor in a big building? Elevator. Elevator. So what does this do? It elevates you <laughs> That's right. If you want to climb, you pull back on the stick. These elevators these elevators allow the nose to go up, you add a little power and you climb. If you want to descend, take a little power off, put the stick forward a bit, these go down, the nose drops, and that's how you descend. You put all those three together, the rudder, the ailerons, and uh, the elevators, and you can do virtually anything except turn around and go backwards. So the next step in the evolution of aeronautics and aerodynamics is something called a drone. You take people out of the aircraft, and that makes it lighter to start with. But when you look at the weight, you see that 
we've got a main body of this aircraft that's made from aluminum. And then when we get into these very swept back wings, which reduce drag and, and provide all that slipstream activity, we see that we have carbon fiber, which is much lighter than the metal that has been used in the past such, on such aircraft as the Spitfire. And as we move back here, the controls that activate all of the, the, the applicable gear to change the, the uh, p pitch of the aircraft, these are all put together by servos. These are little electric motors that, that do the work on the ailerons. So we haven't got cables and all kinds of pulleys and things to try to reduce weight. They've done this and servos are a much better object. We've got a split at rudder on this and the reason for that is because the plane is so light that uh, it takes two rudders up there to do the work of one. But again, look how small scale the aircraft is. When it comes to thrust, we've got this very strange looking propeller, which has been designed and worked out as the ideal shape for moving an aircraft like this and providing the thrust. When we take a closer look at this engine on the ground here, look at the difference between the Spitfire 12 cylinder iron engine and this aluminum two cylinder engine which provides the thrust for this particular aircraft. We're looking here at at the development and the improvement of everything there is in aviation and it is wonderful to just be able to study and be a part. I'd love to be a young person and trying to to deal with those four factors. How do you reduce the weight, increase the thrust, increase the lift, and lower the drag? Aviation, what a life. Hi, my name is Andre Ilyev. I'm a retired helicopter pilot and what I do in my presentation is very quickly run through the systems of the helicopter explaining you know, its relation to lift and drag and the power and from the blades and the wings that rotate through the transmission, the special names of the controls and a little bit about how the helicopter is flown using these controls. I'm going to explain the essential differences between fixed wing and rotary wing aircraft. In particular, how rotary wing aircraft turn their wings to create the lift that's required as opposed to jet the engines pushing or pulling the wings through the air to create the lift that's required. Also the unique feature of the transmission and the, and the, and the uh, inputs of the power through a one-way gear called a spray clutch which allows the rotor system to freewheel to do an auto rotation landing if required. Okay, my name's Andre Ilyev. I'm a retired pilot, and among other things, I used to fly that yellow Labrador helicopter that's hanging over top of your head. And I'm going to talk to you fairly quickly about how helicopters use their wings to, to fly. And afterwards, uh, Keith Mitchell in the orange flying suit, he's a search and rescue technician, and he'll talk to you a little bit about how they use and fly their parachutes and a little bit about what they do. So let's talk about aircraft in general. There are broad categories of aircraft, and a lot of people don't realize it, but the Snoopy balloon on the Golf Channel, that's an aircraft and that category is lighter than air. And powerless aircraft are gliders, but two big categories of aircraft are fixed wing and rotary wing. Now fixed wing are like the big Hercules that you see hanging from the ceiling up there, or your passenger jets, and they use their engines to push or pull their wings through the air to create lift. Whereas rotary wing aircraft, they use their engines to turn their wings to make lift. Now in your science class, you might have heard about Mr. Bernoulli, and he discovered that when air goes over a curved surface like a wing, you get lift just like this. And that's the force that keeps us up in the air. So, how do we turn our wings in a helicopter? Well, Cormorant's got three turbine engines. Most helicopters have turbine, which is sort of like a jet. They don't use the hot gas to push or pull the, the aircraft through the air, but they use the hot gas to spin a turbine, much like water going over a dam turns a turbine and you get electrical power. Well, we capture this hot gas and make mechanical power. Now, it's interesting, when you first start up, we can have the rotor brake on and the engines on really low power and nothing will be moving even though all the engines are on. In the sense they're not connected. Anyway, we take the power off, or the brake off and we start turning these turbines. And they feed their power into this big gearbox through a one-way gear called a sprag clutch. 
You say, what's a sprag clutch? Well, it turns out you guys are all experts in using a sprag clutch because when you ride your bicycle in the, in the summertime, you push the pedal forward, the chain goes tight, and you can't push the pedal forward without the wheel turning. And similarly, but if you're on a little uh, incline, the wheel can turn, the pedals don't move, and you can even spin backwards because your one-way gear allows your wheel to coast. And similarly, we need to have our rotor system to be able to coast if the engine stopped. And, and so it does, and we can use the air as we're descending to keep the rotors turning, and that's how you can do an auto-rotation landing with the engines off in a helicopter. Anyway, we'll put the turbines back up here, and like I said, they're spinning at thousands of turns per minute. And this big gearbox has to slow that down, because if you tried to turn these wings at thousands of turns per minute, this blade would be over the North Mountain, that would be over the South Mountain, and it wouldn't be a very good day at all. So it keeps it at a nice, safe, usable speed. Now the gearbox also feeds power out to the tail rotor. Any idea why we'd want to have a tail rotor? Sure. So it can turn? Or not turn. Both. Because if we didn't have a tail rotor putting a torque or a counter force on, the body of the aircraft would want to spin in the opposite direction of the rotor and almost as fast, and that'd be a pretty wild day too. So anyway, we've got everything turning, uh, so let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, the controls. They have special names, and uh, this is what a little Jet Ranger helicopter looks like. And this control stick here in the middle, we call that the cyclic, and I'll explain as we go. And this collective lever here gives us power and gas, and it's down here in the side. And of course, the two pedals on the floor change the torque, and they're called torque pedals. And up to the tail rotor. So in a bigger helicopter, like the Labrador, and you've got a lot more instruments and stuff, but each pilot has got a collective and a cyclic and a set of torque pedals. Now in a more modern aircraft, uh, like the Cormorant or the S92, it looks something uh, like this. This is an S92, and you, you have a cyclic and a collective and a set of torque pedals, a lot more buttons on it. And like most modern aircraft, fixed wing or rotary wing, uh, you've got a different kind of display. This is what they call uh, like TV type display and this is what they call a glass cockpit and it shows all the information that you need to fly when you're flying. Now once we get these wings turning the names of the controls will now become more important or relevant. During regular flight the cyclic and the collective fly the aircraft just like regular power and flight controls but in the hover their unique features is, becomes more evident because we use the collective to collectively change the wings so that we can go up or down and we use the cyclic to change the lift in a cycle so that the helicopter can move around this way. And the other thing is to note is the special characteristics of the wings. In the old days they were quite fragile and now they're made out of composite materials which is a kind of fiberglass uh, material which makes them much more rugged which they have to be when you consider that they're turning around at hundreds of turns per minute and that the forward speed of the wing at this point uh, has air, the aircraft speed come across and now the wing is backwards and the wing is flowing, uh, the airflow is flowing backwards over the wing at, in certain points. And that's why these wings have to be so tough and strong. That in a nutshell are the features of a helicopter that make it unique. My name is Keith Mitchell, I'm a search and rescue technician and the reason I say that is because in primary search and rescue, search and rescue technicians always work in teams of two. So any aircraft that we fly on in primary search and rescue, we work in teams of two. So whether that's the helicopter up here or that Hercules airplane, the only difference is with the helicopter, I would hoist down or rappel down to the ground. And on this airplane here, I would parachute out the back. Okay, because it goes way too fast to hoist down to the ground. So let's talk about what we do in SAR. I'm going to give you a little example about this mission here and how it relates to flight. This is Greenwood, Nova Scotia, where we are today. This is Goose Bay, Labrador, and up here is Resolution Island. That's part of the territory of Nunavut in the Arctic. This mission happened in 1996, and it was November. It was minus 30 degrees up here. It was 50 km an hour winds, and it was nighttime when this mission happened. Okay? So let's put that all into perspective. There's a gentleman on board a fishing boat here that is dying. He has internal injuries. So there's a Hercules and a Labrador helicopter launched out of Greenwood, and a Griffin helicopter launched out of Goose Bay, Labrador. And a Griffin helicopter looks just like this. It's a smaller helicopter. So when these guys were flying towards this mission, they had night vision goggles on. And when they were flying, remember I said it was minus 30 and it was nighttime? Well, it was also snowing. 
50 kilometer wind. So the weather wasn't very good. And as these guys are flying through the night, they were flying and they were descending at the same time and didn't realize it. So what happened eventually is the bottom of the aircraft, these skids hit the top of the ocean, the airplane flipped over, and then now we're in the ocean upside down. All four people got out and jumped on top of the helicopter, which is now the bottom. But the helicopter is drifting towards shore, so they stayed on the helicopter. But it's still minus 30 degrees, it's still 50 kilometer winds, it's still night and snowing. So, what can happen to them, if we think medically, what can happen to these people? Hypothermia, frostbite, exactly. Bang on, you guys are perfect. So, as they ha these, this is drifting to shore, it stops. It can't go any further because the bottom's out. They're 60 feet from shore, so what do you think they do? They jump in the ocean, again, and swim to shore. Why? Because about two kilometers back, they saw a cabin. Their whole idea was to get on the ground, walk back to the cabin, get in the cabin, get away from the wind, maybe get a fire going. In the meantime, the Hercules, that big airplane up there, is flying over this island by the boat and doing an assessment on the patient. And when they're talking to the guy on the boat, the guy said he was getting worse and worse and worse. So the two Sartex on the Hercules decided to parachute into the ocean so that they can get picked up and taken to the ocean. But when they parachuted into the ocean, remember I said it was 50 kilometer hour winds. It was minus 30, it's night, and it's snowing. And when they get in the ocean, they also found out that the waves were 10 feet high. So from my feet to those pipes is, ab is about 10 feet. So now I'm in the ocean bobbing around with 10 foot waves and I'm in a wetsuit. The whole idea of the wetsuit is to get a thin film of water between my skin and the suit. My body warms it up and that's what keeps me warm. Doesn't happen here because in the ocean when you're bobbing around, water comes in, water goes out. Water comes in, water goes out. So these guys were in the ocean for 30 minutes and we're also, what? Hype, hypothermic. So they were so hypothermic that they couldn't help themselves. This boat sent the little boat out to pick them up, finally got them onto the ship. They cut their wetsuits off, warmed them up. They helped the patient. For 15 hours, they sailed from Resolution up to Iqaluit, got the patient to a hospital, saved his life. Meantime, the helicopter guys are still in survival mode because they're soaking wet in the environment, okay? And Aurora, which is kind of like this airplane, which is that airplane right there, finally sees some flares from these guys and they call in the Labrador helicopter. The Labrador helicopter picks these guys up and takes them to a hospital. Some guys lost toes, some guys lost fingers, some guys had some internal injuries with their lungs because of the cold and the hypothermia and the frostbite they had. Just to go to show you, how dangerous this job can be. You've heard of the, the uh, Victoria Cross? Highest medal that Canada ever gives out, but it's against an armed conflict, against an enemy. These two guys that parachuted into this ocean and were such a dangerous situation that they were received the Cross of Valor. And it could have been any two Sartex, it just happened to be that I was on this mission and, and this fella right here was me. Put that in perspective, there's only 20 Crosses of Valor ever given out in Canada, and two of them were to these two Sartex. Why is that important? It goes to show you the severity of how dangerous the job is, but it also goes to show the type of technology that we use to get where we're going. When I first got in SAR, we used to use parachutes like this, round parachutes. This one right here. The problem with that is that the parachute is at the mercy of the winds. It'll drift with the wind wherever the wind goes. The other problem is when you land, it's a real hard landing. There's no two ways about it. Today, we fly a square canopy. And that's what these guys were flying, square canopies. All right? So this is a square canopy called the Ram Air Square Canopy. Air goes in the front of the canopy and inflates it and makes it look just like a wing. In flying our canopy, there's things that we have to do, obviously. These are called our steering lines. And if I pull on the right one, I go right. If I pull on the left one, I go left. And the important thing, because it has a 25 mile an hour forward speed, to stop it, I have to pull on both of them, and that stops my canopy and I can walk away. So everything we have in our airplane has to be deployed out the back. So we have a parachute for everything. Usually we have round parachutes for our, our equipment. So this light right here is called a night light. That night light is deployed at night to give us a drift to drop our, parachute, our Sartex. What does that mean? If this helicopter is a crash, we'll fly over that, where is it? We'll fly 
This is a daytime one, but it's the exact same thing for night, okay? The only difference is it's dark and that's a light. This is a piece of paper during the day. We'll fly over the crash site at a certain altitude. We'll throw these things called streamers out the back of the airplane. They'll drift with the wind. And when they land, they'll land on the ground like so. We'll fly over our streamers towards our target and count 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, right up until we get to the target. Then we keep counting again past the target till we get to the same count, same altitude, and the guys and gals jump out the back of the airplane. And now they're under their canopy. And theoretically, if they do nothing, they should drift right back to the target. And that's how our equipment gets back to the target. It's the exact same thing day or night, okay? So what do we have that we can deploy out the back? Well, <clears throat> because we're in Nova Scotia, we have equipment that we can use for land and for the ocean because there's a lot of fishermen out there that get in trouble. And the biggest thing that we come across is fishermen that are taking on water to a point where they can't get back to shore in time to get the water out of the boat. So what happens is we'll fly 300 feet above the ocean We'll deploy a 600 foot rope from this pump can, which has a pump in it and eight hours of gas. And as we fly over the ocean, just upwind of the boat, we'll drop this out, the parachute opens up, it drifts towards the boat, and that 600 feet of rope, the fisherman can grab anywhere, pull the pump in, start the pump up, and get all the water out of the boat. We also have survival gear because this is Canada, and if we go anywhere in Canada, we have to be able to survive on our own for up to 72 hours. Okay, so if I'm on the ground at a cross site and I have a patient and I don't have a tent, I can build something like this. And what's that called? Shelter. Yeah, an improvised shelter. But the most important thing is, what's the shelter made of? What? No, you said it. The parachute. That's a parachute. So every piece of equipment that we carry can do two jobs. The parachute gets me to the ground safely, and then I can use it as a shelter. Once we're on the ground and we secure our patients and they're stabilized and we want to get them out of there by helicopter, we have to get them in the helicopter somehow, especially if we're in the woods. We can use something called a rescue basket, or we can use something called a Stokes litter. This is for a patient, kind of like you guys, that can walk. You just walk, sit in the basket, and we'll hoist you up into the helicopter. The Stokes is for those poor people that can't walk because they've got a broken leg or a sore back. We'll lay them down in here and we'll hoist them up into the helicopter like that. And once they're in the helicopter, we can get them on a gurney and take care of them. Now this guy would be hoisting from a boat because he's dressed for the water. He's got a wetsuit on, he has a big knife on, and he's got his May West on. So in case he falls off the boat, he's, he's sorted out for the water. The Sky Genie, there's a good one. In British Columbia, we have trees sometimes that are 200 feet tall. And if I parachute into those trees and I miss a tree, I can fall 200 feet to the ground break a leg or die. We don't want that. So what I do is I get the parachute hung up in the tree. I put this around the risers and that's my lowering device. And I hook it to my body right here. And I, what, is, what do you think this handle here does? Yes. When I pull this handle right here, it releases the parachute. And then I'm hanging just underneath the parachute on this Sky Genie. And then what I do is I unravel the Sky Genie and I can rappel 200 feet to the ground safely without falling through the trees and breaking a leg. Everything we do in Canada, because it's so geographically diverse, we have to be able to survive or get to the page. If we can't get to our casualty, there's no point in going in. So everything we do is a means of getting to the casualty to provide medical attention so that we can get them to a hospital. And because sometimes we have to stay on the ground for a few days, we are trained as survival experts in the Arctic, in the woods, in the ocean. Uh, any environment in Canada that we can go to, we have to be able to survive in. So we do all the training for all the different parts. Okay, well, VP International uh, morphed out of an organization called the, P, uh, the Neptune Club, and, uh, which was formed in Comox, British Columbia in 1966 on a Neptune squadron called 407. Uh, 407 squadron started with 19 people, and the criteria was to have 2,000 hours on uh, said aircraft, and uh, 19 people filled that bill. So they formed a club called the Neptune Club, and uh, within a year, 
within a few months actually it uh, it changed into what was called the P-2000 Club, representing 2,000 flying hours on a Neptune aircraft. What happened was uh, United States, other people that were flying to Neptune, like the uh, United States Navy, uh, Australia, decided they wanted to join this club. So uh, by the end of a year or two, we had three or 400 members. And uh, unfortunately, what happened was the, the Neptune was going out of service. And people were searching for an idea to keep the club going because it would, it would die without an airplane uh, to represent it. So in Greenwood, Nova Scotia in 1970, they had a meeting and decided they would change the organization to a worldwide association, a VP fellowship. Uh, and they started the VP International Association here in Greenwood. And uh, VP International, VP stands for Long Range uh, Patrol Aircraft Land-Based, such as aircraft that were flying at that time were the Argus, the uh, Atlantic, the Nimrod from other countries, and of course uh, the P-3 Orion. Club was the brainchild of uh, Wing Commander then, RCAF, uh, Herb Smale, who uh, lives in Middleton, Nova Scotia at the moment. And he was a great proponent of the switch that we made between VP International, uh, to VP International, and uh, which was formed in 1970 here in Greenwood. And he is still a member and an active participant today. So they developed a symbol to represent it. And what you see behind me is a representation of that, being that the uh, it was Canadian originated for the Maple Leaf. It had uh, the Neptune aircraft on it representing the affiliation with P-2000 Club and its history. It also was inside a gyro, which uh, means precision and stability, which represents the crew of a VP aircraft. And of course, in the background is the globe of the world with no boundaries which rep represents the, the worldwide association that we wanted to achieve. Uh, to date, in uh, 2015, we have over 6,000 members of that organization uh, in 23 countries that are represented. And uh, the headquarters for that here is here in Greenwood. The wing commander of the base is the patron of the organization, and he selects a president whenever required to be the headquarters president for the Worldwide Association with his executive. And then they have a wing here in Greenwood, which is represented by this building. And really, it's the, the historical aspect of the Cold War period that we were all very familiar with. And all of the, all of the uh, photography and trophies and presentations that are represented here are the fellowship that we have the professionalism that we try to achieve with the other countries. Also, uh, what uh, VP International uh, considers is that things are changing all the time in our, with the technology and the role that we play in the world. And uh, so VP represents to us the anti-submarine, anti-shipping, uh, intelligence, uh, surveillance and reconnaissance aspects of what this aircraft, all these aircraft are capable of uh, today. So basically, again, we have 6,000 members around the world and 23 countries represented, and we're trying to achieve fellowship and professionalism in this role. Uh, I just want to say how uh, pleased we are to have you again today. You were exceptional students. You, uh, you really helped us by being on time and uh, paying attention and asking questions. And, and that's important uh, because that's why we're interested in what we do here as volunteers. We have about 70 volunteers that are in the museum at one time or another. And uh, today we had about 20. So that drive in here just to teach you about the technology and the history of this base. A part of the history of this base was the kinds of airplanes that flew. 
but we can see this one. This is a very unique one. This one was built, this big yellow plane here, was built in Amherst, Nova Scotia. They had a factory there in 1941 during the Second World War. Canada was building airplanes for the war effort in Europe. And so they had a factory there that was building Ansons. This was a bomber. Quite a different kind of bomber than you, than you see around now. And I think you've seen those things in the display. Well, one, before it became this, it looked like this. It was just a frame, just a, a metal frame and a couple of engines and the nose cowling. And that's all we had. And that was shipped to us from Wetaskiwin, Alberta, from the Reynolds Museum. And they do those kinds of things. Other museums support us. And Reynolds Museum sent us this stuff. These people, 10 of them, spent 16,600 hours rebuilding that airplane to what you see there. They're all volunteers, come in a couple of times for three or four hours a week. And they spent five years building that airplane to what you have now, because it's part of your history, part of our history. And <clears throat> so it's quite unique. It's like a glider, actually. When you look at it, it's not metal. Inside and when you're walking out, look at that little model over there. All of the wings and all of the fuselage area made out of wood underneath, and it's covered with fabric. They put Dacron on this and they stretch it and it becomes tight. That's what I was saying, it, more like a kite. It had two bomb bays and two engines. Now it didn't, it wasn't a frontline bomber very long, but it did sink a couple of submarines during the war early on. But the technology changed very rapidly in the Second World War and it became outdated. So what we used it for on this base was to train air crew. We trained pilots and navigators and we trained the ground crew for the war in Europe. So people came here and they learned to fly and then they went to Europe and they learned on other airplanes over there that they were using in Europe. So a little bit of history. Amherst, Nova Scotia had a factory. They built airplanes during the war and this was one of them that came from Amherst. So we're really pleased to have it here. And maybe when you come back again with your parents and bring them back, you can explain all that to them. And we're going to put another bomber behind this. We're building another one out back in the warehouse. It's going to take another three or four years, but it's a metal bomber that was about the same era as this one. And the two of them will sit in here and be our display aircraft. All right.